So Andy Adams, he is our uh, CHMM. CHMM is chemical what? Cert certified Hazardous Materials Manager. Okay. See, that's just another title that you get to add onto your name. That's pretty impressive. He has a BS in environmental science from the University of Kansas and then MS from the University of Environmental Chemistry from the University of Minnesota. So you kind of know what you're talking about with this PFAS stuff. <laughs> well, so I'm a, I'm a source, fate, and transport chemist ultimately, which where does it go? How to get there? Where does it, where does it end up? And then Originally, so at the University of Minnesota, one of the cooler things, um, I worked in the laboratory that actually pioneered the PFOS detection with PACE, Analytical, uh, 3M, and the University of Minnesota Research Lab. So the LCMSMS method came from there. So tie back to 2002-ish. So you've been doing it. So you've been, so you know, 17 years on this stuff then. Oh, I don't know if all 17, so is that the, but 17, the yeah, but maybe 18. So, um, all right, excellent. And um, Mark Kiefer um, is a uh, professional geologist. He has a BA and MS in environmental geology from University of North Dakota. And um, is, we always ask, is Fargo your favorite movie? Uh, I said, uh, no, Fargo's the enemy. That's NDSU. Those are the bison. We don't really like those guys. Oh, wow. Okay. So he has 18 years of environmental consulting. And uh, is there anything else you want to highlight on sure. your so resume? A lot, a lot of what I do is brownfield redevelopment, uh, due diligence, and cleanups. And I've done several PFAS cleanups and worked on several sites that had regulatory issues with all these compounds. Excellent. Expert eel pout. Ice fisherman? Is that even what is, is that? I just saw that. I thought, did you add that while I was I wasn't looking? I, I snuck that in last night. So that's awesome. Me and Andy met for the first time on our company ice fishing trip a couple of years ago, and then this last year I had I had lots of luck in pulling eel pout out of my hole. Okay, and what I, I I guess I need that's going to be our next one. So, so What's eel, an eel pout? So eel pout are think of a a big, fat, long, slimy fish that's like feels like it's covered in PFAS. And they're just nasty, and they and they their favorite thing to do is when you hook them, they like to swim in great big circles and tangle up everybody's fishing lines. Oh, so they're, they're just nice. a lot of fun to catch. So, okay, so no, don't fish next to you. That's what you're saying. <laughs> okay, so here's our agenda for our webinar today. So, um, Andy, I guess I'm gonna start off with you. So, uh, I guess why are we? Why would PFOS was kind of like I haven't really heard of it, you know, and a lot. Then all of a sudden. It was everywhere, and it may, why why is that all of a sudden? And kind of so take this from take it away. Talking about over on the right here, this this tree we sort of have. So we've been talking about um, you know PFCs or, or, or perfluoral compounds for a long time. That's a, a huge tent. They're they're anything with with uh, you know fluorine in them. Are, they they sort of start counting those. Um, we narrow it down now, and so that's a PFC. You'll see that often. Sometimes people have moved away from these substances referring to those, but then we have PFAS, so per or polyfluoroalkyl substances. So that's sort of the temp we're going to talk about today. And you have two real groups of those. You have perfluoroalkanes and you have per polyfluoroalkanes. And so if you can't tell, most people don't say these words because they're difficult. So in the perfluoro, all perfluoro means is there's a carbon and there's a fluorine. And so when we put those together, you have different chains um, and they make up PFOS and PFOA, PFOTA, PFOTA, a bunch of PFOSA. There's a bunch of them. But potato, potato. Yep. Mm -hmm. Big thing to know here is we're talking about PFAS, PFAS chemicals in this specific webinar they are a group uh, there's a much bigger group we're not talking about those necessarily and next slide where are we well one thing they know about these two is that they're an emerging chemical so that we're really in the infancy of our understanding about these compounds and one thing to note is there's between four and six thousand of them out there so it's a lot and we're just starting to kind of learn about them they're an emerging contaminant we're just starting to kind of figure them out We'll talk a little more about that here in a second. Yeah, so the, the chemistry side of these things. Yay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I won't be too boring here. So the important things to know is that they're persistent, they're mobile, they don't break down, and they can flip forms depending on what media or environment they're in. 
Uh, like Mark said, there's between four and 6,000 species of these things. And we think that there are about four to 600 that are stable. So they, they actually appear and, and will be around for some period of time. And now maybe the shocking part of this, there are 16 to 30 that we might look for on any given day on a list of that somebody considers important. So I'm, 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 I'm only doing this because it becomes important to what goes on here. These things have a hydrophobic head and they have a hydrophilic tail. Hydrophobic, fat loving, hydrophilic, water loving. And so that leads them to line up, hydrophobic up, hydrophilic down, and they, they, they basically form a film. And that's the most important thing about them. They form a film. And that film can be on a table, it can be on clothes, it can be firefighting foam. Mm -hmm. That's why these things were designed. They're really good at getting in that confirmation and creating that film. So they can be acidic and they can be non-acidic. That's the PFOA uh, is acid. Um, most of these, the, the popular ones that you know about, PFOSA, PFOA, are eight chains. That's the O is octa for eight. Um, and so you have eight carbons, you have fluorines per carbon, and that's how you get the chemical. So the important part about that in the eight is longevity. They're around for a long, long time. And the longer the chain, the longer they're around. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll get into some more of that here in a little bit. So we, we're talking about... Um... You kind of mentioned a few minutes ago, waterproofing, fireproofing, anything um, to make something shinier? Or, I mean, is or really, it's water and grease resistance is the, okay. the key thing, or surfactant properties. And what? Okay, what? Yeah, we'll get into that maybe. I'm gonna ask a, little, a few more questions later. I'm like, it's gonna be horrified. Maybe I don't know. So one thing to know is why are these of concern? Like Andy said, it's both because of their chemical properties. They're Molecular structure makes them very resistant, very tough. They last a long time. They have their chain tail with the carbon, the fluorines, and they have a functional head. You can sometimes split those apart, but that tail is very resistant. It sticks around. So they are very resistant. They last a long time. And they were used in lots of different things because they do have those unique properties. They're great at being stain resistant. They're great at water repellent. They're great at being a surfactant, spraying out, putting a fire out. So everybody knows about kind of the big uses, right? The firefighting foams. They were developed as one of the first main uses to help put out fires quickly, especially liquid fires, not your paper, but this would be your fuels that are on fire. But because of those oil resistance, the stain resistance, the surfactants, they're also used in lots of other things. Think food packaging. And then it's greasy. You go to get a burger at a fast food joint, that wrapper is going to be resistant, so it doesn't just soak right through. Think cosmetics. You know, how do you have streak-free streak mascara? How do you have... No run cosmetics where they got PFAS in them. Think about medical industry. They're wearing those gowns that are all blood resistant. They're coated in PFAS. Non-stick cookware, same thing, because it doesn't stick. So they're using lots of different things. Pesticides, photography. They're very much ubiquitous in our environment in these consumer products because they work really well. Yeah, so I, I, I guess the thing that we, you know, we usually talk hazardous waste, we've had webinars on hazardous waste. A lot of that stuff is like, you know, in residential areas, it's like, you know, you're not really going to be affected that much in there. Okay. I have every single one of those things in my house, right? You know, yeah, well, probably fast food. I don't know. Yeah. So, but it's interesting so, too. I mean, is not only they in the packaging, think about microwave popcorn. Uh, inside, I know all the inside that bag is covered with PFAS. You then heat it up to a high temperature and you eat it. That yeah, the and day. then another one I just learned about interesting that's, that's very interesting is who, who likes to ski or go snowboarding? The waxes using those have a lot of PFAS. What they're finding is the waxing, the ski technicians are having really high concentration of PFAS in their blood because when they're heating these up, it volatilizes and they're ingesting that. And that brings me to another point. Unfortunately, Lance, all of us have this in our blood already. The polar bears in Antarctica have it in their blood. The image on the left of the screen there is the impaired waters. As we said, they're resistant, they're in everything, they get out, and so they've impacted a lot of areas, and we find them everywhere. Well, the polar bears probably have them from all those Coke commercials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just okay. Well, and so to that point, 
what have these, these been around for about 70 years. And if you look at that, that's about half of the lifetime of RECRA when we actually went in and started to, to think about how we dispose of things, where we do it, what is regulated. And, and not that that would have caught all this stuff, but um, they're, they're everywhere and they haven't been well regulated to, right. to where we put them. Right. For most of their history, we just dumped them wherever or put them to a landfill that wasn't built to contain the property. Okay. How long do we know that they don't dissolve or they don't break down? Well, like what? how long they last? No, no, no. How long did we know that uh, they don't break down? So they were first being made in the 1940s and there are conflicting results, but I've, I've seen some say as early as 1960s, they knew these might be a problem. Wow. And then it's kind of built from them. And really, the driver, though, is probably in the early... Oh, oh, we yeah, sort of figured out that uh -oh. that we weren't managing them correctly, that they might be a real potential problem. Yeah, kind of early thousands leading up to 2006. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, because, I mean, you definitely, it, it's kind of a good bad, right? You definitely want your firefighters to have fireproof clothing. Yeah. I don't want it in my Cocoa Puffs. Right. That's kind right. of the rule, right? Yeah. But we're finding out. Well, terrifying Pizza boxes, the pizza bottom boxes. Of uh, Now you're j jacking with just my pizza. Coated with beef. I'm not going to be able to eat anything anymore. <laughs> Got to go out and just uh, you know, graze no, the grass that's not outside. True. I'll get over it. Trust me. So, so we were kind of alluding to, okay, they're using lots of products and they're very resistant. And so what that leads to is this, what we call the PFAS life cycle. There's really a few ways they get into the environment. One is through a purposeful application out of fire. You purposely put them out you spray them on the ground to put the fire out. Well, then they you know, spread across the ground, they get into the soil, they leach into the water, water spraying them, some gets up into the atmosphere. Another way they get out is through manufacture, coming out the smokestacks, coming out of a plating facility. A lot of plating facilities use PFAS because they are using hex chrome in the plating. Hex chrome is very toxic. To prevent the hex chrome from going to the smokestack, they spray the PFAS on top of the surfactant, but then the PFAS goes up the smokestack instead. So kind of coming out through the smokestacks or through industrial releases due to uh, incidental spills, or again, back in the day, the disposal, there wasn't any really disposal rules, so they would just get rid of it where they could. The other way is through consumer products. They go to a landfill, they leach out of those products, get into the landfill. If it's an online landfill, they go right into the ground. If it's a lined landfill, it collects in the leachate. Then what most landfills do is they take that leachate and they send it to a water treatment plant. Water treatment plant puts the leachate through their system. At the end, it condenses down into what's known as a biosolid. Those biosolids are then taken, and about 50% of those in the United States are reapplied to farmland as fertilizer. Well, guess what? Those biosolids are full of PFAS. So you apply that to the farm field, leaches down into the soil, gets taken out by the plants, and the whole cycle starts all over again because they don't break down. They just keep going through this cycle. So there's the big thing here is you have this circular bait and transport with a material that doesn't readily break down in nature by the processes we're putting it through. That ends up in a pretty brutal cycle going from start to finish, around and around. And you know, you talk about the water treatment plants. The problem is they were never designed to handle these chemicals. So they're designed to ha handle petroleum or bile products. So they have oxidation, they have different filtrations, but those processes were never designed to deal with PFAS. Okay. So really we get into now, you know, why, why are we worried about this, right? Um, what's, the, what's the issue with it? So what, where we're at right now with uh, the PFAS chemicals is uh, they're a probable carcinogen, and so that's not wholly different than than perchloroethylene or perk or something like that. The reason that they are probable is because we don't have enough human health data. We don't go around exposing people to to PFAS for the the benefit of of science. That's not how that research happens in the U.S. Um, and so there, we don't have direct link studies. And so that's why we consider it a probable carcinogen. Uh, things that we have data on, so a lot of blood data, a lot of cord data, um, meaning mother to infant, that cord is an important transfer. Um, 
but we see premature birth issues. We see thyroid issues, hormones. The reason that we're seeing those type of issues is because of where these things accumulate in the body. And we, we know, as, as Mark and Lance discussed, we have polar bears that have PFAS in their blood. And the only way that gets there is through aerial deposition and things like that. And so what that really tells us is that these chemicals are ubiquitous and they're in all of our blood as well. Um, so if so if they're in all our blood and if everybody has them, why are, why are we not seeing more of these things? I mean, like you would think that if we're, if it's all in our blood, there'd be, every baby would be a premature almost, or, you know, every, um, you know, so cancer would be skyrocketing, which I guess, you know, there's going to be an argument that it kind of is, but exposure and the level of exposure equals the risk. Right. And so, different levels of exposure. One of the things now that we know some of the actual higher exposures, so Mark was talking about the, the, the ski bums that are, that are applying waxes and things, be a pretty interesting study to go look at one of those guys and see long-term what the health effects are. Or, you know, take yourself a different direction, maybe a firefighter exposure that has had been around a lot of AFFF over time. It, it, this is really one of those things that slows the regulatory status because we don't have human studies. And mm. so you're going to see through this presentation that that there is a lot of push to have legislation. And one of the things that slows that down is the inability to come back and relate to the human health effects. Well, as that, as time moves on, that will vet itself out, but that doesn't help today with tomorrow's right. regulation right again this is all in the early stages right so as we learn more and again we don't have conclusive proof on what the harm on these are so it's so okay. let's work on that i do have a question from uh the audience do you see consumer use of pfos declining if health risks are emphasized or do you think it would be required it would require financial incentive to move the public away from them so it's a couple different parts of that question one is we have started to voluntarily stop using all these products or they're using new form of formalizations. And he said, you know, there's thousands of these. We've only really looked at a handful from a toxicological standpoint. So there are new formulations being used all the time. One problem, a lot of those new formulations from what I've read aren't as effective. So there's some resistance to use them, but there's also not real good toxicological data on them. So I would see probably some reduction. I know a lot of, you, you go to a supermarket now and you look, a lot of panels say, you know, PFOA free or PFAB free. But what they're not telling you is they're using some other PFAS instead. Mm -hmm. So I think there probably will be some reduction in use, especially the ones that we know are bad actors, but they're just constantly finding other replacement products for them. Yeah. And I mean, there, there's going to be a, you know, and I use it, this a, kind of a risk reward. I mean, but, you know, I go back to the firefighters, fire resistant stuff. I mean, you know what? I, I, that to me, the risk is greater than the reward the is greater. The reward is greater than the risk, right. I would have meant, right? Especially if we already, if we all have it in there. So, right. if we, well, in our blood. So, anyway. the other important thing here with that question is, uh, and we'll get into this, there have been some voluntary um, um, phase outs, but others have filled that void mm -hmm. in finished products. And so we'll, we'll get into that actually on the next slide. Yeah. I say, keep our firemen safe, get it out of my pizza boxes. That would be a good start. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and part of why it maybe hasn't been banned yet is that there is a lot of regulatory confusion about these compounds. Are they regulated? How are they regulated? And that's kind of the infancy. A lot of people always ask, you know, is this a hazardous substance? So the word hazardous gets thrown around a lot. A lot. Is it a hazardous waste? Is it a hazardous substance? Is it a hazard? But under federal law, the word hazardous substance has a particular meaning. And it needs to be designated that by the Environmental Protection Agency. And to this point, it has not. They are in the process. There's lots of steps to get to that point. So while the EPA hasn't been able to designate it as a hazardous substance yet, they're working on it. In that void, states have started to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'm from Minnesota. Minnesota has their own version of the Superfund Law CERCLA, which is where you would designate this as hazardous substance, called MERLA. 
And in Minnesota, they've decided that they're going to call a hazardous substance or hazardous waste under MRLA. Under MRLA, to be a hazardous substance, you got to meet one of three criteria. Two of those criteria are tied back to the federal designation, so it fails on those two. The third is what they call hazardous waste. And hazardous waste, I won't give you the exact definition, but basically it's something that can impair the waters of the state. So Minnesota has said, we consider this to be a hazardous waste or at a minimum, a pollutant or a contaminant. What's interesting about that though, though, is that this has not been tested in the courts yet. Minnesota sued 3M in that they were fighting over the designation of these chemicals. Are they a hazardous substance under law? 3M said, no, they don't meet the definition because they have not been designated by the federal government. Minnesota said, yes, they're a contaminant or pollutant in our eyes. There was never a decision in that case because they settled. So it's gonna be interesting to see as, as states continue to make their own designations because the federal government has not yet, will those stand up in court? And we really haven't seen cases yet that have tested that fully yet. So as we alluded to earlier, states are kind of taking the lead on this. The two main ones, the PFOS, PFOA, those are the two that we've studied the longest. We know the most about. They were your Scotch Garden and your AFFF, as well as other uses. And they're ones that appear to have the most toxicological risk based on what we know now. 3M and DuPont both voluntarily phased them out in 2006. Again, they moved to other compounds instead, but that doesn't mean it's been banned across the world. Germany still produces a lot of it, as does China. China, in the last few years, has produced as much PFOS or PFOA as the United States did in our entire history within the last couple of years. And so then those are now being put into products that are coming right back into this country. Which is perfectly legal under U.S. law because they're coming in in finished products. Right. And I, I guess it would be really hard to, you know, um, code something hazardous when PFAS is in everything. And then you're like, then everything's hazardous. Well, you right. get into a chicken or the egg argument. How do you have to go about it? And um, a quick example here with the, the PFOS and the PFOA voluntary phase out. I was associated with uh, a fairly big fire event recently. And they put out a call for, for firefighting foam. And I would say probably 80% of what came in was AFFF, which makes sense. I, I mean, it, it's probably the best at doing it. Uh, meanwhile, that all came from before 2006. And guess why we can do that? It, well, we talked about it. The stuff is really stable. It doesn't break down. It makes that film. So one of the bigger shocking parts is that, and maybe it's not shocking, but it, it goes against the risk part, but it goes back to that reward part. The fire marshal actually wanted them to use a triple F more once they got the fire out to coat this area because it's a better coating material than the newer foams. And by coating it, you kept the fire out. And so it is very much a quandary and a conundrum of applicable use value and, and then risk. Okay, we have one more question from our audience. Um, does C6 or lower PFOS have shorter half-lives, i.e. do they break down more readily? So the, the studies aren't 100% conclusive, but typically the shorter chains are not as resistant in the environment. So yeah, but again, unfortunately, it's not a 100% rule of thumb. They are so many different formulations and chemical properties that in general, yes, but it's not 100% true all the time. But in general, the shorter chains are easier to break down. The heads and uh, of these materials and the mix of the materials really starts to... So some of these things get sulfur added to them. Some get other things. The ability for microbes to pick those apart varies widely over the thousands of chemicals that there are. I would say as a general rule, do they break down quicker? Probably as a general rule, but w when we're talking quick, nothing with this stuff is quick. Right. We're, we're talking half lives in in in, in multiple years, uh, you know, tens of years here, and not not that that the whole. I don't necessarily like the moniker forever chemicals because nothing is forever, but it 
it fits, they don't break down quick. It doesn't matter if it's a C4, C6, C8, and as it goes up, it just gets I worse. Think I think C13 is the longest I've seen, but they get up there. And again, there's no that of all those thousand, we've only studied a few. Mm -hmm. And so the task, and not only studied from a task logic standpoint, just studied from a properties. You know, do we, we don't hardly know the Henry constants or, you know, for the basic chemical physical structures and properties of a lot of these chemicals aren't really known. So it's hard to know exactly how they you know, react in the environment, how they break down, how they move from form to form, because we just don't have the studies out there yet. And on the screen now you guys are seeing, I mentioned that states are kind of taking a lead while the federal government is working through their process. The orange shaded states here are those states that currently have some type of soil, I'm gonna call it a criteria or standard or advisory. They vary because sometimes it's just a guidance, sometimes it's actually something that's been promulgated, sometimes it's just kind of a rule of thumb. And the big thing also note is, you know, take this graph with a grain of salt. This is based on data I collected in January 2020. When I did something similar six months ago, it was a fraction of this. It's, it's changing by the month. If you go to the next slide there, this is the states that have some type of water regulation. Again, waiting for the EPA. So a lot of states have passed their own. Again, this is a mix of some actually have standards, some are just criteria, some are just advisories. And obviously, why are there more states that have standards for water than soil? Again, because the main route of absorption is from drinking this stuff. So this, the, most of the studies have been concerned about water. Meanwhile, we have to ask ourselves, is that good regulation on a number of levels, right? One, countrywide for a fairly ubiquitous problem, is that is that good regulation? And then two, if you're only regulating groundwater, is that good regulation? Because surely you, you need to deal with the soil side of it too. So right. I, you know. And vice versa. It, for sure. it, and meanwhile, it is what we have. So. Kind of going back to regulatory status, kind of wrapping that up. So there are currently no federal drinking water standards. The EPA, because it's not a hazardous substance, they don't haven't made an MCL yet. The EPA has probably a health advisory and it's changed over the years. I think the first one came out in like 2006 and it was in the hundreds, again, part per trillion. The current health advisory from the EPA, so it's just a technical guidance of what they think is safe, but it hasn't been promulgated to a full MCL yet, is 70 parts per trillion for either PFOA or PFOS by themselves or combined 70. And I alluded to that this changes very rapidly, literally weekly. January 2020 of this year, the US House of Representatives passed a resolution that the EPA needed to come up with a timeline for when they were gonna regulate those two. So again, that's just two of the thousands to regulate those two. Just last week, the EPA announced that they are putting together a plan for when they will promulgate drinking water determinations for those two compounds. Two years late after they were required to. Correct. And originally it's supposed to happen, but you know, these are very complicated. And as we've alluded to, once you regulate them, there's going to be such a ripple of effects from reporting and permitting just to lawsuits. The lawsuits, once under CERCLA, you can start assigning liability to polluters. There are going to be a lot more lawsuits than there already are. And I think that's one reason why it's been somewhat slow. Meanwhile, you have states doing their own thing. Some are following the EPA at the 70. Minnesota is half of that. And you mentioned earlier that any, I mean, the water filtration systems that most cities have don't deal with PFAS anyway. So, Correct. and there's really not anything out there that can help with it? Uh, there is, and we'll talk more about that, about okay. there are some ways we can limit exposure, especially to the drinking water. So, yeah, because I mean, if they come out with a plan and then they, then there's going to be municipalities out there going, oh, we're over that. Well, meanwhile, some days you have to actually have regulation to force innovation. And that's yep. one of the things I, I think is going to happen here as, as we, as EPA is forced maybe to, to bring some kind of a standard up. Ultimately, I don't, I don't think they, they will come up with a standard for, for, for PFOS and PFOA, but ultimately I think this is going to lead to a place where we have a you know a mixture additive effect type of regulation um, with this that we see with some other some other things and Mark, you, I think you have an example. Yeah, I was just talking about. So you have standards for some individual compounds. The problem with PFAS is you're not only drinking one compound; you're usually drinking several compounds, and there's an additive effect. They're not they, they, when you add them together. There's a 
more severe effect. Plus, they can have added effect with other pollutants. So if you have solvents or petroleum in your water as well, it all adds up to a higher effect than just individually each of those compounds. I was working for a municipality that had a well with some low-level PFAS in it. Now, each of the compounds individually were below the water standards, but the Minnesota Department of Health is looking at it from an additive um, viewpoint, especially when it's a water supply. So they're using what they call a health index. So they would take all those chemicals, give them a score, add them together. If you were above a one, it was too high. Again, individually, each of the compounds were below the standards, but this municipality had an index between one and two pretty consistently. So they obviously took that well service many years ago, and they're working on a treatment center to take care of that well. Well, and that's all on today's levels, right? And yep. so what what will tomorrow's levels bring, which I think is a tad amount to trying to deal with liability and risk here, right? And so what are the effects of this legislation over time? So cleanups is maybe the first and forethought. Um, these things change every day and they aren't promulgated by EPA. And so to be able to go in and address a cleanup, you're gonna to have to go in and negotiate with the agency and the project manager that you're dealing with because it could change, it could be additive, it could be, the EPA could promulgate a rule right in the middle of this. Um, and so to, to go in, you've gotta to talk to the regulator, which might be a little terrifying to a lot of folks, but it, it's going to help in the long term for your cleanup. And and so with the regulation side of the, the world, they're, they're going to change. And so we're going to have to be prepared for that. And we're going to have to think through how we're dealing with these up front because it might behoove us to deal with them in a different way than how you could deal with them right now because of that risk and liability in the future. Um, and one of the things I think is gonna be just mystifying a little bit. So if, if when these become a hazardous material or a, a hazardous chemical under federal law, permitting goes into shambles on a lot of things. So that wastewater treatment plant that we talked about that's taken leachate now has to worry about actual PFOS or PFOA, or they are going to try and regulate them for those chemicals. And so we've talked about, Lance, we don't have a great way to, to remove these or to destroy them. And so that, again, that's where we get into, regulation will spur innovation here, but it, it's, a, it's a concern. Landfills, TDF, TSDFs are gonna have to deal with, with how they, um, they deal with this stuff, and so um, one of the one of the interesting things I guess I've had with a landfill, um, you, you know, how they deal with that leachate and what they will take is still unregulated, and they're going to have to deal with that. Uh, for the regulated communities, TRIs, waste generation, generator status, tier twos, all of those things change now. One one. IBC, so one 300 gallon um, tote of AFFF, and you're probably into reporting on a number of different things. And if, if it's a hazardous material, so. Um, you know, and what about, you know, Domino's Pizza? Are they now going to be a small quantity generator because they got PFAS in the pizza boxes? Mm -hmm. I don't think so, but that's, you know, that's once they're regulated, it opens up a whole new world. Or throwing it. In the garbage. Pizza, pizza boxes get destroyed and they go throw them in the municipal solid waste container. That's not designed to handle that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, very few pizza boxes are thrown away at Domino's anyway. They're thrown away at my house. <laughs> oh, so there you go. Are you a responsible partner? Maybe. Domino's? That's yeah, what you yeah, have hey. to cut back on your pizza gonna, consumption. Man. Swimming our man. I, don't, I, don't, I don't really appreciate it that much. So that's just where we're talking about, you know, once these things do become regulated, not only does it open up the permitting, it's also going to open up a lot more money and funding to do to hopefully fill in some of these data gaps. But there is some hope, you know, so what can we do about these now? You know, get aside from the regulations and the permitting, what can we do if we have them in our environment? How can we remediate them? Again, this is in the infancy. We're just starting to figure out how we can deal with these products. And some of it's going back to old technology. 
And one approach is you try to stop the infiltration, stop their spread. So that's just what we call capping. You literally turn into a parking lot. It works fine if you can, you, know, you cut off the infiltration so water is not pushing these chemicals farther. It'll work as long as most of your mass is already above the water table and you have a, you put a parking lot over it. I think it's not everybody wants a great big parking lot for their property. It limits the use, limits the value, and that parking lot needs to be maintained in pristine condition for, well, for forever. That's one approach. The next is you send it to a landfill, but we've already talked about the limitations. You gotta make sure it's a line landfill. You gotta make sure they can handle the leachate and what they do with that leachate. There are, you know, can we actually just, so what, what I'm trying to say is most of what we're doing now is we're trapping them. There's my, it's a trap. We are just sequestering these things. We're binding them up. We can use, you know, uh, activated carbon, GAC systems. They will absorb and remove the PFAS from the water, but then you just basically transfer the PFAS from the water into the carbon vessel, which needs to then be replaced. There are some ion exchange resins out there that do the same thing that can be regenerated using a brine. So you can pull the PFAS out of the water, so at least you can make the drinking water safe. But all we're doing is we're just trapping them. We're not destroying them, not getting rid of them. And are you really trapping them? I mean, if you're just putting something on top of it, it doesn't mean it's doing anything because right. it may not be go up in the air directly, but Correct. it's going to spread out and down and in the water and around. And Again, so, these are barriers. They're not perfect. Yeah. Then there might be ways to deal with the carbon capture technology, right? You could take it to a landfill and encapsulate it in Portland and, and concrete it. Is that real efficient? It might be. We're, we're going to have to do some research right. on that side of the world and figure that out. You know, the the incinerators too. We talk, there's there's research out there that says that they can deal with it. Um, it it's really hot because it, of course, is stable and, and right. these great chemicals for fighting fire, right? So they they might not even really right. want this. So there are some bench scale studies on incineration and. There's not a lot though, right? There's been a few papers put out about incinerating these chemicals to destroy them. And, and they, some you know, studies have said they could destroy them as low as 450 degrees Celsius. Others said it was closer to 1000 degrees Celsius. So we're talking about you know, commercial industrial grade incinerators, not very efficient, very expensive. And again, they're still on that bench scale level, kind of they're an emerging technology. They're not a proven technology. And that's as, as simple as it is, Capping a site's a proven technology. We've used it on other chemicals. It works, again, under the right conditions. And again, it's just a barrier. Carbon, it works. It pulls them out. But then what do you do with the carbon? What do you do with it? You get incinerate, you send it to a landfill, you mix it with cement. But again, right now, we're just trying to make the drinking water safe. Hopefully, as more funding becomes available, as more technology, as more research, we might be able to find a more effective way of, of getting rid of these compounds. So one of the more interesting things, and I'll give you some real life stuff here, Landfills in Texas, where I operate a lot, um, are are scared of this stuff, and, and probably rightfully so. We've talked a lot about leachates and things, but uh, Class Two landfills so it won't, for the most part, if there's a known reason for it to have PFOS or PFOS, won't take that material. Uh, class Ones have asked me to test for it, and I ask, you know, well, what's the regulatory level that we're going to look at, and they don't have an answer. I've heard, you know, other things from them. They they are struggling, I think, with it, and they probably see the bigger picture. There are regulations coming, um, and then even a hazardous landfill. Um, one of them in in Texas has told me that, you know, the ability to accept this, they don't know what that level is. They'll look at it on a case by case basis, and that if it got too high, they could take it out to one of their arid west landfills and so that tells me that they're they're worried about leachate they're worried about concentrations high enough to cause PFOS in the leachate and then having to deal with that leachate and then we would be worried about the cost cost and right. and impacting the groundwater and being a sure being I mean, a PRP yeah. and risk and liability and that goes back to those decisions driven is it the best way to deal with, or the cheapest way to deal with it today? Maybe not, but it might be the best way to deal with it today. Hmm. Um, before I go to the next slide, Mark, I just wanted to congratulate you on adding Admiral Akbar to your presentation. You're welcome. First time ever, so I mean, it's <laughs> impressive. I do what I can. So we talked about you know regulations, remediation, cleanup, but where does it all start? Usually it's with a property transaction or some financial where you're doing a phase one. And what are we doing in phase one? We're trying to identify, are there any recognized environmental conditions or wrecks at a site? Are EFOS chemicals a wreck? 
And that's a very interesting question. There's kind of two sides of the coin. There's the strict definition. A wreck is the presence or likely presence of any hazardous substance or petroleum products in or on or at a property. And we've already said these are not currently regulated as a hazardous substance. They are also not a petroleum product. So you could say, one person could say, well, they're not a wreck for that reason. But is that really best for both our clients and for the environment, you know, for people buying their liability and their risk to just say like, well, it doesn't meet the definition. I'm not going to worry about it. Well, tomorrow the EPA could designate a hazardous substance. So is it in our best interest to ignore it? I think not. I think we need to think about the site. And the same thing, are we going to call every pizza hut a wreck? Are we going to call every place that sells carpeting a wreck just because they sold those products? And I think you need to take some common sense approach to is it a recognized environmental commission or not? You know, was there a reason for to suspect a release at the site? Was it a place where they were doing firefighting training? Was it a place that had a fire? Were they producing those there? Was it a plating facility that had the misters? Some place that would have actually released these, not like a, a, a pizza place that just had the boxes. And I think if you're not comfortable calling a wreck because it doesn't meet the exact definition, at a minimum, you're not doing your client, you're not doing the public a service, you're not at least calling it out as something, additional consideration or a data gap. I have done several phase ones in Minnesota on PFOS sites. And we've typically called them a wreck if it could be tied to some type of a known release. This is near a 3M dump area. This is where there was a fire. Then we would definitely call it a wreck. Yeah, I think it just does a huge disservice to a client if if there's a site that we can consider that, that there's possibly a known release and not calling it out. It, do you call it a wreck? Do you call it a data gap? I, 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 I'm I'm a little bit indifferent there, but you need to bring it to the attention and we need to go and look at it because it could be a huge risk or liability, future liability to the client and that won't go over well long term. No, and I think again, think about the local regulatory environment. Minnesota has argued that it's a hazardous waste. So I can't, I, I can just find Minnesota, I'm gonna call it a, a wreck. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so again, that's just the definitions. Yeah, it really, it really gets down to, and, and so we'll moving forward. We'll have to consider some of this when we get into other PFOS and PFOS sites, right? If it was historical, if it's a, you know, an actual controlled situation, right? You know, are there, are there any HREX? You know, was it totally cleaned up to regulatory? Satisfaction, you got that letter that says it is, or is it controlled? Did you just put a parking lot over it? And what was that regulatory level when it was cleaned right. up? Right, and we're, and you know, uh, for example, these are so new, there is very few regulatory assurance letters even out for PFAS sites. I got one of the first NADS, or sorry, no association terminations in Minnesota for a PFAS site because there are so new, and the regulatory mm. environment is still figuring out can they even give liability assurances for these? Mm. And the ones I've gotten have all been tied to no release sites. So, Looking at specifically, you know, some of this, there, there's there's uncertainty with with how you deal with these things, and and we've basically worked out a plan on our side if we do call something a wreck. Right, and then once you call it a wreck, obviously the next step is you need to investigate that wreck. So again, that's where using common sense. If you call every potential incidence of PFAS because there was an old, you know, there was an old surface dump there. Oh, they might have thrown something that might have one time had some PFAS in it, like a pizza box. Should you sample? The problem with these are, they are ubiquitous, right? We didn't talk too much about it, but they get into the atmosphere, they travel all over the place, they surface, they deposit back onto the earth. I've taken samples, many, many samples for PFAS all over the, uh, all over Minnesota, but I've also read several studies of people taking soil samples from around the globe. And 80 to 90% of those samples had detectable levels of PFAS in them. Most times we're talking very low single digit per petroleum, but they were there. So again, if you're gonna call them a wreck and you go and investigate them, there's a really good chance you're gonna find them. But if there's any carbon in that soil, any topsoil, any silty soil, clay, if it's not a pure clean silica sand, you're probably gonna find them. And does that mean there was a release? You know, a, a wreck has a condition, you're trying to show was there a release? Well, was there a release or not? Or is it because the sampler was touching the seat of their car, which was treated with Scotch guard before they put the sample in the jar? So that's where you got to think about, you know, should you sample? Is there evidence of a release there? And then if you are going to sample, you better know what you're doing. So on the right hand side, there's just a screenshot of a, this is a technical memo that you know, we produced about 
bronze field methodology for sampling. And as we alluded to, right, did they wear sunscreen? Did they have a granola bar for breakfast? Did they eat some chips? Did they touch the car seat? Did they use, oh, there's Teflon in the containers for the other samples. Is there Teflon tape on your pump? Is there Teflon tape on your pump? Did you use Teflon tubing to sample the water for some other chemicals? So you can't just send somebody out there with a glass jar and go sample for PFAS. It's a, it's a whole process where both the field sampler needs to know what they can and can't touch. Did he use the wrong type of marker to write the labels down? I mean, it gets, it gets that from level. The, probably from the moment they wake up, I'm going to go test PFAS today. And, yeah. Or, yeah. or if they don't know, hey, you got to go test. We got to go test this today. Yeah. Well, I got to go, well, go take a shower. Well, that, well that's it, right? And, and the clothing they wear. I mean, if this isn't something you can do like today. It's it's days in advance. The clothing, you know, to meet EPA and what I follow, ITRC, other people's regulations, it's natural fiber clothing that's been washed at least six times, no fabric softener, no dryer sheets, organic soaps, and then right, organic uh, shampoo. And so you got the it, you need to think days in advance before you sample this, and then you have to be careful what you're touching while you're even driving out there or getting out of your car to make sure you're not cross-contaminating and giving yourself a false positive. It sounds impossible. It, it's tough. And it is, we, especially in your car, is probably loaded with this stuff. Right. So what the people have to do is you got – Your really steering wheel. Your, your field staff have to know that the minute they leave the car, they're scrubbing down, and you have to use certain types of soaps. And here's the fun part. You got to use PFOS-free water. Now, most a lot of water supplies are contaminated. You can't take anything – buy, buy off a shelf at a grocery store. It's not going to be PFOS-free. You have to get PFOS free certified water. So I get this water. I have a lab that provides it to me. It's $40 a liter. So now think about deconning. You fill a five gallon bucket, that's what, 10, 15 liters of water times $40 a liter. Wow. So it adds up fast. So that's what I'm saying. There's, there's a whole process to, to sampling for these. A funny anecdote is in our offices back in Minneapolis, we have a lab grade DNA's water system. That should be good enough for me to get PFOS free water, but guess why I'm still paying for it? Because there's Teflon fittings in the hmm. layout of that supply. So it's fine water for anything else, but PFOS sampling. So that's why, again, sampling is difficult. You got to know you're doing the field staff, I have to be trained how to do it. Okay, so um, let, I'm going to bring up a scenario here, real quick. So let's say I'm, I'm buying a, a piece of property, and right now there's no, there's no standards on. PFAS contamination, correct? Again, states states have regular amendments. Um, okay, so so but we'll say let's say you're in a state that doesn't currently because there are some. Okay, so okay, so I buy so I buy this property and then you know it, it, there was a fire and you know what it was bad and they used foam and, and whatever. So um, I mean, so what you're saying is my property in all likelihood is pretty contaminated with this stuff with PFAS. So. Potentially. Potentially. I don't know how it wouldn't be because you're saying it's it's impossible to get rid of and it spreads like the wildfire, but whatever. Okay, so so I buy it. I'm like, okay, great. Well, then, you know, EPA down the road says, oh, guess what? We're putting a standard on there and now your property is contaminated. You get to clean it up. And, and by the way, it's going to cost, you know, thousands of dollars just for the guy to come out and sample it correctly. So... I mean, so I'm sure that's going to be the case in a lot of places. Yeah, and we're, we're already seeing that to start to happen. So Wisconsin, the way their regulatory, their voluntary program works is when you clean up a site and you get closure from the Wisconsin DNR, the state actually takes on the liability for that site going forward. Now, when they wrote that regulation, they never thought of something like PFAS. So what Wisconsin is doing now is they're going back to people who are in the program right now and say, no, you have an industrial site, you, know, you need to sample for PFAS. Minnesota did something very similar with vapor. Vapor became a big thing in the early 2000s. There were lots of sites closed before that for soil ground contamination, never thought about vapor. They reopened them. So I can see more and more states reopening sites to go back and look for PFAS. Uh, California recently sent out a directive to all plating facilities that ever had a hex chrome plating operation that used PFAS that they need to, on their own cost, start taking soil samples all around their property because of the PFAS that was coming out of their stacks from the Hex chrome protection. So yes, I do see this being reopened. And so even if you're in a state that currently doesn't regulate it, know that there was just an article that came out, I think literally yesterday, about saying that over half of the states in the country are working on some type of regulation on these, and it's going to keep going. By the end of the year, I'd be shocked if almost every state didn't have something. And again, at some point, the federal government will put out some regulations. Yeah. So one of the things about you know Park, we we 
talked about that today is how you know if you have perk in your in your property it it's hard to get rid of and so it's you know there's things that you can do to remediation but it, it can be very expensive um, and the main th reason is is that it spreads quickly and fast now does does PFOS is it I mean we know it doesn't go anywhere but does it maybe like okay the good news is it doesn't spread as fast no no so, so it's a double threat it's very mobile it moves easily between media it will transform forms and it will um, for the most part unlike perk it doesn't break down well perk Perk, <laughs> believe it or not, will break down, you know, to some, some degree, right? And for uh, PFOS, that, that's just not the case. It doesn't break down quickly and it will be around a long time. So the, the mobile side with the, with, with the longevity is really a double edge. And that's why we talk about I guess my interest in this stuff is really risk and liability and how we go about that, you know, going forward on these kinds of sites because it's coming. It's just a matter of time. Okay, we did have a little bit of a sound um, technical so, issue here. So I apologize. I stuck my phone. I actually hit the power button. So hopefully, so hopefully it's, it's working now on us, but... Uh, so hopefully you guys can hear us now. So maybe type in some of the Yeah. So um, yeah, I just got. Uh, anyway, we'll we'll find out here. So they said they can hear me fine. Okay, sorry not, about that. I won't start the microphone. They said not Mark and Andy, so uh -oh. that's not good either. But the good news is, is that we're over. We're through. We're done. And um, so unless you had anything else to say, can you hear me at all or not? I don't know, but here, here's a question. Here's a question from the audience because we'll, we'll find out. Does fire resistant or fire retardant clothing contain PFAS? Yes. That's really scary because um, baby clothing has is fire resistant, fire retardant yeah. stuff. Probably not to the point of what they're getting at. They're getting at actual FR, uh, FRC type stuff, um, but most clothing for a long time had some type, yes. and so there's still some type of PFAS chemical. Yeah, like Gore-Tex, right? Any, any waterproof or stain-resistant clothing, so your rain gear, your outerwear, your waterproof boots, those almost all had or still do have PFAS in them. And are there TCLP tests for PFAS in landfills? No, no. there is no standard that's that to the hazardous designation until EPA promulgates actual rule making. And so this is still a long process. EPA yes. has to promulgate rulemaking. They have to take public comment. They have to then figure out what those levels are and then they would install some type of concentration uh, for a T-clip, but then you would also end up having to rewrite SW846. You got to have a method. The lab has to go do it. So it's it's a giant snowball. Once they're finally made a hazardous substance for all these other things. Okay. And would it be possible to calibrate the PFOS probes to accommodate the small contamination from the field engineer performing the sampling? So what you would do is you do a very rigorous quality control process when you're sampling. So you're doing, you're doing a lot of blanks. So it's not just the cause of the sample. Every sample you're taking, there's going to be two or three additional blanks that go in. Blanks on the water, blanks on the equipment you use, blanks on the jars themselves. So you have to have a very rigorous QHC program to then hopefully eliminate what's caused by the sample itself. And you know, we, one other thing I do want to mention too when it comes to um, sampling is it's expensive. You got to know what you're doing, but the results take a long time to get to. Because isn't you know, most of our chemicals we do nowadays, you can get results in two or three days. You're looking at three weeks minimum for results from this. Just know that investigation. Your due diligence is going to take a longer if you're dealing with PFAS than it would be if you're just doing maybe with chlorinates or petroleum. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, I just fixed the audio oh, as, no. as we're as we're closing the the webinar. I just fixed the audio. So as we had the power outage, um, it uh, my new computer when we plugged it back in, it didn't recognize the the hardware, and so that's so I apologize for that. So we were going off of my one mic, and that's why I'm getting all these texts and saying, "Hey, I can't hear." Them. All right, so we should probably go back to what we missed. So, um, but. Uh, we are getting close. I, I want to be respectful for their time. So, I, what I will do is I'll, I will send the I will send um, Mark and Andy these questions, and we'll answer. We'll have them answered and sent to you guys uh, in the meantime. And so, again, technical difficulties are not ever fun. So, here's a little bit more about Braun Intertech and um, the uh, the scope of the award winning services that we provide. Um, our clients. And um, here is the contact information for Andy and Mark. Um, so if you have any, so if you do have questions, you can ask, you can actually call them or email them. They'd be very happy to, um, to always, answer, happy. always have to answer the PFOS questions. And, and maybe even if it's in the middle of the night, if they wake up in terror, Mark, would that be okay too? That, so I guess the biggest thing is, I know we kind of, well, doom and gloom. You know, I don't want people freaking out, running away, throwing away all their pots and pans because of what I'm talking about. Just know that, you know, we're working on it. There are very smart people all over this country who are trying to tackle this. And, you know, just it's better to be informed. And the best thing to do is just, is just work with knowledgeable people who know what they're doing to get you through these processes. So our next webinar is Air Construction Permits. And um, that's going to be with uh, Sally Perry and Vanessa Coleman on March 26th. So if you haven't uh, signed up for that, uh, please do. And also go check out our new our website. Uh, we just we just did a whole redesign, and so uh, tell us what you think about it. So, Mark, Andy, thank you so much for very in, informative and a little terrifying <laughs> webinar. And I appreciate you guys did some really some great work and some hard work, and I know that I appreciated it. And so and we had a lot of questions, which was a lot of um, activity from our from our audience so that's usually telling me that that's a that's a good sign so thank you guys thank for you everything. Lance. okay thank you. you guys have a great rest of your week thank you everybody bye thanks